Dear students, guests and colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining our second MCC Transylvania Lectures. Our main idea and goal is to provide a platform on a monthly basis where we can discuss the different topics and issues that preoccupy the thoughts of the intellectuals of our days. In order to achieve this goal, we invite foreign speakers, renowned thinkers, to share their ideas with us. I would like to thank every single person who made this seminar possible and functional in these such hard times. The moderator of this conversation will be Dr. Callum T. M. Nicholson. He studied anthropology at the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. He is currently a fellow of the Danube Institute and a visiting fellow at MCC. I'm going to invite Callum to uh, present our speaker and guest for today. Callum, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. You're not part. It's lovely to be back in uh, Earth Day in College of Our in particular. So uh, today I have the great honor of introducing my colleague and friend Gladden Papin, who's a fellow, a fellow at uh, MCC based in Budapest. Gladden has an extraordinary record. He studied history at Harvard. He has a PhD in government from Harvard. He's an assistant professor at the University of Dallas. He was the co-founder and current deputy editor of American Affairs. And he's recently in November started a substack uh, called the Post-Liberal Order, which I recommend you subscribe to. So I'm not going to waste any more time uh, listening to me. Uh, I'll pass it on to Gladden, and he's going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have some questions. And I just want to say, for the questions section, I'll inevitably probably have a question or two. but. You can put your hand up to ask questions, but also, if you don't want to do that, there is an app that you can submit questions through. We'll have an iPad. I'll keep an eye on those questions, and hopefully we can get them all in. We'll have about 20 minutes probably for questions. So thank you very much. And with no further ado, Gladden Papin. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, I think I'm, I may have seen some of you before um, at the Budapest campus. Um, I'm not sure, but great to see you again. And thanks to all of you um, who are coming out here uh, to hear this tonight. So uh, the topic is American politics, uh, the good, the bad, and the future. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying that in, in a way, I wish, I'd, I wish I didn't have to give a lecture about American politics. Like, why does, why does, why did, like, here we are, we should be talking just about, you know, local or, local or regional politics or local or regional history or something like that. Um, that's why I'm here. I mean, I'm here to learn about uh, the region. I've been living in Budapest since September um, as a fellow at the MCC, so I've learned a lot about um, Hungarian history, culture, and politics, um, and about the Transylvanian region as well. So for me, it's primarily a learning experience. Um, so my goal is not to be, you know, the American guy who shows up and just lectures about the importance of America for an hour and disappears. Um, but unfortunately, whether or not you are interested in America, America is interested in you. Uh, or maybe it's not. <laughs> maybe America is just interested in itself, but unfortunately, again, what it chooses to do affects you um, and me and everyone. So why is that? And what are the, what are the features of this American power? What aspects of it are good, or what's the fundamental aspect of it that's maybe good, and the aspect of it that's bad, and how do those play out into a result for the future? Um, so as my mental guide for this, um, I'm going to take uh, a Frenchman um, who happens to be someone who wrote a really good book on America, or a really good set of books on America, um, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, and this is Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville was a French aristocrat. Some of you may have, uh, maybe, maybe you've read some of his, some of his works, works before. Um, and he traveled to America in order to, in his mind, 
uh, discover what was coming next in Europe and everywhere. So he wrote a book called uh, Democracy in America. Um, not American democracy, not the democracy of the United States, but democracy in America. And his idea, his insight, um, which he had when he was about your age, um, sitting in France after the revolution, um, in the years after the revolution, his thought was that something had been unleashed in America, or that something was present there, and that by going there and looking at it and, and trying to understand it, he would be able to understand as well the political trends of the future. Um, so I'm taking my inspiration from, from that. So what was that thing that he thought was present in America that would come to be everywhere else? He said that he felt a kind of religious terror thinking about America. Um, that, um, and again, this was, this was before America was um, a large global empire, you know, exporting its cultural products, um, you know, it's Hollywood movies, it's Coca-Cola and it's McDonald's, you know, to all the four corners of the earth. This was well before that. This was when it was basically just a fledgling country, you know, 40 years after the American War for Independence, um, which ran from 1776 to, to 1783. So it was really just, you know, 40 or 50 years after that when America was a very very young nation. Um, and uh, what, what Tocqueville found in America um, was not a nation in the way that that term might be used in Europe. I know it's used in a lot of different ways. But it wasn't just you know, one people um, with identifiable with an identifiable history, identifiable characteristics, you know, a shared language, a shared religion, a shared location. It did have many of those things. In the early, in the early era of America, it was mostly in New England, um, you know, Anglo-Saxon Puritans. These were people who had fled England um, uh, for reasons of religious persecution or for reasons of adventure and colonization and conquest. So not just religious persecution, but it included a lot of people who had fled England um, to avoid religious persecution. So in New England, there were the English. Um, north of them, in the St. Lawrence Valley, you had the French, Nouvelle France, um, and a, a little, a much, I mean, by population, New France was much smaller than New England. Um, and then you had also the Spanish. But the United States of America was born out of the English um, political tradition and the English constitutional tradition. And so the characteristics of those people mattered a lot. Um, and what Tocqueville, so to, I'm going to borrow a concept from Tocqueville and then we'll kind of put him aside and I'll kind of uh, spend that out a little bit for you or explain a little bit for you why I think it's an, an important thing to consider. Um, you know, in other words, these were people who had come from England. They had a lot of characteristics that were similar, having fled persecution, um, all being from England, whatever. Um, but the fundamental characteristic that they had was what interested him. And he used a term called the social state. They all shared a social state of equality. So whatever circumstances the English colonists had had when they were in England, much of that was stripped away in the process of settling this new land. Uh, yes, many of them were nobles in England, 
but when they arrived in New England, they all were kind of in the same boat. They, you know, had similar sized properties. Um, they were all in this location, this location um, that was partly inhabited by, um, you know, indigenous Indian tribes and, you know, partly uninhabited and wild. They all had to contribute equally to this, um, this process of colonizing and settling New England. Uh, and as a part of that, they were sharing this fundamentally similar circumstance. So in Tocqueville's mind, they left behind the aristocratic world. All of the, all of the countries in Europe at that time had some form of aristocracy. They had some form of aristocratic government. Um, but in America, as the English came there and settled it, all of those elements were, um, all of the aristocratic and unequal elements were leveled. Uh, not just because the noble titles weren't as important, there were parts of um, the Americas where the, where the titles were you know, preserved for some time. Um, but in the fundamental condition, it was basically like they were in a new land with nothing. There were Indians there, but there was nothing. And they entirely had to make something out of it. And in that experience, they all ended up sharing this same kind of baseline condition of equality. They all had, you know, the same size land. Basically, they all had to work on it to make, um, you know, viable farms. It wasn't like a long tradition of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of highly articulated human civilization. There was nothing. And even after they settled New England, looking to the West, there was still nothing. They pretty much soon realized that they were on a continent which, again, aside from the presence of the French and the Spanish, who were steadily kind of pushed out of the way, um, or quarantined, I guess. The French, unfortunately, got quarantined in Quebec. Um, so they realized that there was this vast space, like a vast horizon, which demanded or you know, called forth from them um, the desire to subdue it. And in these, two, in these two aspects, you have, I think, the good and the bad of American politics. They're the same thing that appears in different ways. So America has this, uh, was founded on this um, original condition in which everyone um, had a kind of equality. So some of, the, some of the, the hierarchy and the differences that were present, say, in France or England or the empire uh, or the kingdom of Hungary or pretty much anywhere else were not there, like the vertical element. Um, everyone was in, the, was in a similar situation. So, um, I said just now that this, this fundamental equality became the source of a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. Um, a lot of good tendencies that have become emblematic of America. I know that they're not exclusively American, but they're things that have become emblematic of America. I'll name some in a, in a second. But there's another side, maybe not a, sometimes it is a dark side, um, but there's an excess, or an excessive side, and this sometimes um, spills over and creates trouble. So what are those, what are some things that we could put in each one of those categories? Um, you know, early in American history and now, and why should we care about them? Um, in Europe, why should we care about them here? Well, um, 
some of the things that are good that come out of this, um, this original equality. Self-reliance, the, um, the desire and the need to improve the situation around you. Um, inventiveness and creativity. All of these were necessities. They were born of necessity because the, you know, the original settlers of New England arrived in a place where there was basically nothing. And they developed uh, rapidly, you know, a sense of, um, you know, uh, improvement, innovation, um, and entrepreneurship. So from a very from very early on, um, you know, they were there on their own, not dependent on, um, or not able to rely exclusively on their their king or their you know sponsors. In England, they had to uh, develop this, um, you know, sense of activity, um, and that has carried through in a lot of parts of of American life. Um, you know, uh, Tocqueville, in his book, again, this is you know, root in, the, in the early part of the 19th century, talks a lot about how associations and the rapid forming of associations would become characteristic of the democratic age. Prior to that, the main people who were, you know, actors, who were initiating things, who were doing things, who were starting projects, founding hospitals, founding schools, founding new towns, were aristocrats. They were the nobility. That's what they did. People followed along and, you know, joined in the project. Um, but in the democratic era, Tocqueville saw, when everyone is in this situation of equality, everyone will have an inclination to start to improve their lot, to improve the things that are around them. So, and not to just be dependent upon um, an aristocrat or a nobleman or a king to resolve the problem. So, um, in the little townships of New England, which Tocqueville visited, he noticed that there were constantly associations forming for improvement. Um, parent associations for improving schools, a little association in the neighborhood to improve the streets, um, uh, and associations for uh, moral improvement. Already at that time in, um, in America, there was um, uh, there started to be associations uh, against the use of alcohol and against drinking, which led ult ultimately led to one of the darkest and saddest periods of American history, when the sale of alcohol was banned, <laughs> um, called prohibition. But anyway, so that's a good an example of you know, a good impulse, you know, we're gonna form these little associations which will help people improve, will improve the things in the town, you know, we're not gonna wait for someone else to fix the street, we're gonna fix the street ourselves, you know, on, on Saturday morning, and it goes over into an excess. Um, well, you know, drinking too much can sometimes cause people to make bad decisions and, like, be good for nothing, therefore we should ban it entirely. It became this kind of, uh, it became this kind of crusade. So these, um, uh, according to Tocqueville, these, these impulses arise out of that equality. We needed to improve our situation. We were beginning an era in which the old distinctions between um, you know, upper class and lower class set by rank or hierarchy or aristocracy would be fading away. And in the new era, if you wanted to solve a problem, you would have to do it yourself or band together and form an association and do it. Of course, that exists in Europe. It's not just an American thing, but it was something that Tocqueville thought was archetypal of the democratic age. He went to the place where this sense of human equality and similarity was strongest. Um, because we were, because 
um, Americans all shared this fundamental similarity, he said, it was easy for them to put themselves in the mind of the other. Right? It was easy for them to see things from the you know, perspective of their fellow citizen and to expect that, their, that they, along with their fellow citizens, should be able to reach an agreement on how to improve whatever it is. Better planting of crops, you know, inventing you know, more machines, whatever. And obviously, um, you know, over time, America uh, excelled at that. I mean, it was an immensely creative society, um, and still is in many ways. And it was a, and it's been a society um, defined by the American dream, right? People talk about people talk about the American dream. What is the American dream? Um, that from this situation in which everyone enjoys a kind of similar um, equality of opportunity or a, a similar fundamental situation, that you can improve your lot and get rich or whatever. Um, or you know, improve, improve your circumstance, improve your situation, um, and improve society. All of those were parts of this, um, this drive or this mission which came to characterize American democracy. But um, to start to push this in the direction of how that could go wrong. Obviously, we've already talked about, you know, the gravest error of this during the era of prohibition um, when the sale of alcohol was banned. Um, but there were other bad things too, or other ways that this impulse um, began to spill over and uh, to become something dominating or even imperial. Um, with, the, with this this sense of equality that we had, or that came from the, the fundamental American social state, some of the injustices and bad things that were a part of American life were able to be resolved. For example, we had slavery. Slavery is not good. <laughs> um, and slavery was a part of uh, racially enforced slavery was a crucial part of the American economy and society up until the Civil War. That was resolved. The, somehow, this underlying sense of equality, which had originally just been possessed by the, you know, the Puritan Englishmen who were white, you know, spread itself um, and encompassed, you know, everyone in society white as well as black, and led to the abolition of slavery. There were other injustices as well. Even after the, even after the ending of slavery, um, you know, there was a, we had a, we had something kind of like uh, apartheid or a, a segregation of, of white and black races in the United States. So there were different services available for whites and blacks, they couldn't go on the same, you know, buses or trains, things like that. Um, that too, by the middle of the 20th century, uh, in the 1960s, was resolved. This, you know, sense of equality, um, you know, um, pushed in that direction. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, was the famous black preacher who was um, a pioneer of the civil rights movement and he described this, um, this sense that emerged from the American idea of equality. And he said, um, the arc of history bends toward justice, or something like that. And this was a, this was a very, um, very typical American sense that grew out of that expectation that equality is something that we have and something that will spread. Um, and over time, if we follow this sense of equality, not only will we have you know, a better, more productive, uh, richer society, but one that is more just. The trouble is that because this idea of equality just emerged um, kind of 
from behind the scenes or from, the, from our fundamental situation, from the memory of um, you know, life in early America, something that was almost kind of imprinted on the, the mind or, or the soul of Americans, um, it's been very difficult to define where the idea of equality should begin or where it should end. And this impulse to make things better, to improve things and to make things more equal, which obviously can be a good impulse when there is some problem or some, some injustice, um, it became a kind of quasi-religious um, passion. You know, it became something that society was not only, that not only, you know, animated society, but that it became conscious of and started to pursue uh, radically. Um, you saw this even in the Civil War in the United States between North and South, um, when, you know, the, the, the North realizing that slavery was such an injustice decided that it would be better for Southern society to be burned to the ground, you know, than for any form of injustice based on slavery to continue within it. And as a result, you had one of the first modern wars, uh, the conclusion of which was the General Sherman literally burning his way through the South, just lighting entire t towns of men, women, and children on fire. So it, this impulse doesn't know where to stop. In the 19th century then, you had uh, the concept uh, that they termed manifest destiny. Manifest destiny was the idea that, okay, so we have, we have American society in New England, um, but there's a gigantic continent, so God is calling us to march from here to the West Coast, and if we find any, like, you know, Indians in the way, then we should just kill them because they're not part of the new, like, equal society. They're standing in its way, or we just push them out of the way and put them somewhere else. Um, but our calling is to spread this idea of equality all the way to the end of the continent, all the way to California, and to have, the, uh, to have this um, you know, mission of equality um, take hold everywhere, as far as we can possibly spread it. Um, that idea as soon as, as soon as it spread from the east coast of the United States to the west coast, that wasn't enough to contain it. It had no way of containing itself. It became such a fundamental drive and such a fundamental passion that right about the point that we controlled um, you know, the entire entirety of the continental United States from California um, to New Orleans, to Florida, to Maine, to, you know, to Washington and Texas and everywhere in between. And by the way, you know, e expanding and moving across the entire continent, which is twice the size of Western Europe, you know, it's like a, a big, I uh, think required pushing a lot of people out of the way. For example, Mexico, which controlled the state where I now normally live, Texas. Um, and when they when they when uh, when they decided to do that, it was very much, you know, uh, oriented around this missionary impulse. Uh, you know, Mexico is, um, you know, Spain, and therefore part of a dangerous, uh, dark, backward Catholic empire, and all those things are extremely bad because they're against equality, right? Um, so we're justified in coming in and just taking, 
taxes away from Mexico because we have the principle of equality and that's what we're about and that's Spain, which is the darkness of medieval hierarchical society and it needs to be flattened and pushed out of the way. Um, so right about the time that we controlled all of North America um, was right about the time that you started to hear about um, American power beginning to project itself on the international stage, right around 1900. Um, and basically, the story of the last 120 years has been the presence of the United States military on an international stage um, fighting for and projecting everywhere its conception of equality. Now, I mean, without picking like particular examples, I'm sure some of the things, some of the um, wars that the United States participated in, it participated in in a just manner. Don't know, that's a can of worms, so we'll just leave that over there. Um, but fundamentally, people understood this as part of the same mission, um, that they started to conceive of America as a, um, as a chosen nation, chosen to um, spread this idea of equality all over the world. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Hungary um, gave an interview to uh, Mondiner, and in that interview he was asked, you know, what do you think about um, the role of China in the coming century. And he said, well, he said, I'm not gonna get this quotation correct, but roughly what he said was, well, yeah, China is going to be very important, um, and you know, the, the nature of Chinese leadership will be a big question, but we know one thing. The Anglo-Saxons always demand that you morally accept that they are morally superior. You have to morally accept that, that the Anglo-Saxon Empire is good. The Chinese don't do that. They don't say like, well, you have to become Confucian. You know, they don't say you have to, you have to study Conf the sayings of Confucius and practice Confucian religion if you want us to like build stuff in your country. No, they just build stuff. Um, but the Anglo-Saxon Empire always demands that you accept its notion of what? Its notion of equality, which again, can be a good thing, can be a good notion, but also often doesn't know where to stop. So um, returning to American domestic politics, we ended, we did, we ended slavery, that was bad. But then Americans start to get in their minds, well, everyone else needs to end slavery too. And you say, well, America, um, we don't have slavery. Well, you need to end it right now. You know? <laughs> well, we don't, we don't have it. Well, you need to find something that's very similar to slavery and end that, right? Um, so you see, like, um, that we had the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States in summer of 2020, right? Um, when a bunch of cities were basically burned to the ground, like Minneapolis was basically burned to the ground um, after, the, after the death of um, George Floyd. But then you see like uh, BLM protests in random cities all over the world and I mean, I mean, in smaller form, but you see people like trying to use the same thing, the same concept, and it's like, well, maybe this, maybe there's something to that in the United States, but it's not this. It doesn't, you know, trans, it doesn't translate the same way everywhere else. That that can't enter the that doesn't compute for the American Empire, you know. Well, no, you know, we're morally good because we're spreading equality, therefore you have to do the same thing. 
um, in the same way, and you have to show that you're doing the same thing. Like you need a BLM, you need at least one BLM sign in Kolesvar, I would say. You know, you need, you need just somewhere to show that you're aware of the same things and committed to the same thing if you want to be a part of the empire. Um, and that's where, it that's where it changes from being, you know, maybe something that's good. Um, equality is good. We don't want people to be conceived of as fundamentally unequal. But then there's no way, there's, where do you stop it? Um, and for maybe complex reasons, America has had a difficult time figuring out where to stop. Um, I'll give you another example. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Um, got about 10 minutes left. Um, another example from more, from more recent times is same-sex marriage. Um, people can have a variety of opinions on this subject. Um, in America, the question around same-sex marriage was resolved um, in 2015 by uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, which is a judicial body. I think at that time about 20, 20 of the 50 US states had some form of same-sex marriage. Um, and you know, there had been a big, big campaign which was called, get, and guess what the symbol of the, of the pro same-sex marriage campaign was? An equal sign. It was an, e an equal sign, it was a yellow equal sign on a blue background. Um, that was the symbol. Um, and people literally just asked, are you in favor of equality? Not, are you in favor of same-sex marriage, but are you, you know, do you support equality? Well, yes. Well, do you support same-sex marriage? Well, no. Well, then you're against equality. You don't support equality. Like, they, it had to be, I mean, I think actually that, I, I should have brought a picture of it, but I'm sure, I'm sure you saw it or have seen something like it. You know, the fact that it's just, like, the mathematical equal sign is the symbol sort of captures that it's this idea of equality that doesn't know where to stop. So basically what happened in America around 2015 is that there had been like a, um, you know, a, long, a long campaign um, to push the idea of same-sex marriage um, and to browbeat or just to harangue people into, into thinking that um, you know, if you don't support this idea, then you are, um, you know, racist, uh, sexist, you know, bigoted, homophobic, against equality, you know, basically the devil, right? So over time, that kind of wore people down and people said, okay, fine. We just want this argument to be over. I don't even care. No one cares anymore. Just, just do it. Just stop talking about it. Um, because finally, once we resolve this, maybe we can stop talking about um, sex-related stuff constantly in public all the time, and instead we can talk about like um, improving the economy or something. Big mistake. That is not at all how it played out. Um, and if you you know if you if you followed the logic of the of the talk. Of course it didn't stop there. It can never stop. There's no, there's no principle on which it could stop. So 2015, which was the year when same-sex marriage was extended from about 20 to all 50 states, to me now feels like the Middle Ages compared to America today. I mean, you know, the, the, the level of, you know, rapid expansion of the concept of equality from there is off the charts. I c could, would be difficult for me to even describe, but one example obviously is, um, you know, w there should be like three-person marriages and four-person, you know, um, not a couple, but a thruple, right? I think, I think, I'm not sure, but I think in Massachusetts there's even some kind of legal arrangement for, for that, um, for throuples. And there are definitely like, you know, reality TV shows around that theme. Um, 
and, uh, and all sorts of other things that, uh, that I can't even mention in polite company. But basically, again, just the, the core part of the dynamic was most people just got sick and tired of the debate and said, fine, just allow the damn same-sex marriage and be done. And it was allowed, and that was the beginning, right? And from there on out, it's, you know, drag queen story hours for children and, um, you know, transgender surgery for children and all sorts of absolutely insane stuff. Um, there is nowhere that it can end. Um, to bring things around to a more uh, contemporary point, uh, in the period 1989 to 1991, um, there was a lot of changes in Europe. Um, and um, America concluded, after the, after the Soviet Union collapsed, America concluded that it had defeated the Soviet Union, right? And that the concept of equality had defeated the Soviet Union. And therefore, after 1991, if we just injected more equality concepts, if we have a whole bag of equality concepts and we just sort of dumped them out, then more countries would go through the same process. For example, China. If only we gave, if only we um, give China lots of money and trade and encourage it to, um, you know, manufacture things there instead of in America, then it will become a democracy. Um, if only we build a McDonald's, um, then, you know, wonderful things will magically start to happen. It's pretty clear that that world, that that is a very serious misconception of reality. Um, and amazingly, even Western corporations now seem to understand that they do not have this power. They do not have the magic power simply by engaging in commerce to transform the entire world into a gigantic Walmart and liberal democracy. What's the evidence of this? They've all pulled out of Russia if they really believed that their presence magically turned everything into America, wouldn't they stay? No. So America is now in, I've sort of made this point, making this point maybe a little too quickly here at the end, um, but America is now in a, um, a strange moment where it's pretty clear now should, it could have, it should, maybe it should have been clear a hundred years ago, but um, it's pretty clear now that um, you know it doesn't magically have the power to turn the rest of the world into itself. There is another power or two, um, China, for example, which has been investing heavily all over the world to build real physical things in the physical world and not to impose an ideology. Whereas America right now, not building anything in the physical world, spreading a bunch of stuff in the digital world um, and attempting to impose a radical cultural ideology on countries that basically want no part of it. Um, that is a, that's a very fragile situation to be in. So America had, you know, um, a long period in which it could at least globally make the claim that everything was following the same trajectory. We became more equal, you're going to become more equal, we're all going to become more equal. Um, that's good to a point. It clearly ran far off course if Drag Queen Story Hour, et cetera, are any evidence, which I think they probably are. Um, and it's also run off course geopolitically. 
because America thought throughout the years after the end of the Cold War that they could just magically spread liberal democracy to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. The result of all that is basically disaster, you know. The end of the Christian communities in the Middle East, the Taliban's back in control of Afghanistan, they didn't accomplish their goals in Syria. I'm sure they'll have no problem dealing with Russia and China. Well, no, it's probably the opposite. Um, so, if we were to, if, we, if I were to have given this talk 10 years ago, it might have just been a warning um, that things could go off track. But now it's pretty clear that they went off track morally you know, that the idea of equality went way too far, way beyond what any, like, ordinary person, modern, even what any, you know, reasonable modern liberal person would think in large parts of America. Um, it's clear that, you know, we don't have any guardrails on where um, to stop spreading that. And it's been turned into a kind of weapon that can be like directed at um, and used against countries like Hungary and Poland, which have been subject to the um, you know EU rule of law mechanisms, basically for as a part of cultural warfare. Um, but now it's getting dangerous. Now it's clear that um, you know China doesn't fear that more market activity is going to threaten the place of the Chinese Communist Party or the place of China in the world as a whole. Instead, they're looking at America like, well, you guys have a, you, uh, America, you've got a great, you know, techno empire and like you're really great with, you know, advertising, marketing, you know, social media, influencers, um, you know, meme warfare um, and uh, info information warfare, but like, that's not all there is, America. There's another world, um, the real world, where if we take a peek at the real world, with no commitment to a particular ideology, China has built up its influence in pretty much everywhere. Um, and what is the result of all that going to be? Well, I can't make any predictions, um, except that it's very important um, for the West to realize that this expectation of the, of the you know, endless spread of um, liberal democracy and you know, the permanent expansion of the idea of equality to include everything with no limit all of that is very dangerous um, and has put us into one of the most frightening geopolitical moments in, I don't know, 60 or 70 years. Um, so where will all that go? Your guess is as good as mine, um, but thank you for letting me try to paint a bit of the picture um, and I look forward to your questions and points of discussion. Thanks. Can we set up there? Hello. Right. Thank you, Gladden, for that. That was fascinating. Um, just very quickly, I, I thought that uh, something that uh, you said uh, you, when you talked about the sort of cultural imperialism of America. Something I find quite interesting in the last couple of years is that there's a great call, for instance, in British universities to so-called decolonized curriculums. But what I find very interesting about that is that it seems to me precisely American cultural imperialism, American cultural culture wars are colonizing English culture now. And so actually the very call to decolonize in some way strikes me as almost us being colonized by the, the, the current uh, uh, trends and the current sort of virtues uh, in America, which is, I find it an interesting irony. It used to be the loud American abroad was the guy in the baseball cap 
you know, being loud in the bar in Europe, and now it's often the person telling you that you're not being moral enough. It's often the, uh, you know, the the uh, the graduate students who come to um, universities in the UK, which I find interesting. Yeah, and that, I'm sorry, is this on? Is this on? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, and that's and that's um, and that's used against uh, that's used against the Hungarians as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the the notion that comes out of of post-colonial studies um, or anti-discrimination studies or whatever, decolonization studies, um, is that you know, all Europeans are equally guilty in you know, various projects of colonization and conquest that you know, destroyed the rest of the world. Um, and you know, then the, the countries of Central Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, which have basically been put on the chopping block, you know, of other empires over the last, um, you know, hundred or more years, are are treated as though they were part of the same project when it was almost the other way around. Um, so now you have like, you, you know, now you have the European Union targeting Poland, or targeting Hungary, or targeting the other, um, you know, Central and Eastern European countries as being, you know. Um, too conservative or whatever, um, and you know they need to they need to get with the they need to get with the program and join the you know the um, adopt the guilty conscience of the of Western Europe and it's like hey mm. like this seems so inverted in so many ways. Mm. Another thought I had um, uh, listening to your talk, you talked about the rate of change in recent decades, and there's a great American film called The Tree of Life, which some of you may have seen a Terence Malick film from about 10, 12 years ago. And I, it's a film which is set partly in 1960 with a bunch of 10-year-old boys. And there's a particular scene where they're running around a house playing by throwing a ball over the house. And I saw the film last year, and I remember thinking, it's interesting, I was the same age, a 10-year-old boy in, in the early 90s, 1991, I think, basically. At the same age, those boys in 1961 or whenever it was. And I remember in 1991 thinking 1961 felt like the dark ages. But now I realize that my childhood as a, you know, an eight, nine-year-old boy in 1991 is more in common with the childhood of a, say, of a boy in 1961 than a kid in 2021 because of the rate of change. And that was startling to realize that, that I'm very much of the 20th century in my formative experience. But from this, I was thinking that um, where you talk about this, this, this urge to uh, progress in America, what you made me think of is, it seems to me, and I want to put it to you, that in the 19th century, it seemed America progressed to the coast, to the west coast. And then when they ran out of land, your argument is they progressed you know, abroad, and I, I'd agree with that. But it also seems to me something else happened with America, is that once it hit the coast of the furthest you'd extend, you could extend the farmland, and uh, in an era when land was power, then they began to say, well, what's a new dimension in which we can progress? And it was technology. And then in the 20th century, they, they progressed to the limit of technology, or the limit of physics, even, with some of the technologies. And as soon as they hit that, suddenly, with the limit of technology, we're, we're, we're in computing, we're in the internet. And now, within that world of the internet, we're pursuing the limits of morality. We're hearing about you know, this pursuit of equality to the point where, is it too far, as you say? but also this idea of greening the economy with climate change, this notion that we need to completely overturn our entire economy, a new form of economic growth through greening the economy, is, is a form of moral entrepreneurship. It's saying there is, there is, you know, there's clearly a business in greening the economy as a moral uh, uh, imperative. And I, I'm wondering, um, uh, I mean, do you recognize that? that, that this, this, this seems an incredibly American phenomenon to always be, the, the impulse to progress seems to be to always exist in everything that America does. And when they, when they seem to exhaust one dimension, land, they turn to another, technology. When they exhaust that, it's morality. Do you think that's true? And if so, what's next? Yeah, <clears throat> no, but I think that, I think that is a very, a very good diagnosis. Um, and I see it a lot in corporate culture, basically. Um, you know, the, the big tech corporations in the US now, it, they have like a, th this trend that you're, this cycle that you're describing has become kind of like a, a secret knowledge, an esoteric wisdom, and you don't know what new cultural trend they're going to pull out and demand that you embrace. So no one knew, you know, in 2020 
that they were going to pull out um, you know, BLM. And so by 2021, you know, everyone's adopted BLM and then, but you know, by the time you adopt it in Europe, it's too late. You know, we've already moved on to um, the danger of right-wing terror groups. I think that was 2021 plus COVID, you know? Well, it's interesting. It seems so similar to me to how every year we, we you know, if you're up with things, you, you know, there's a new iPhone, you get the new version, and it's cool for about three months until the, the next version comes out and you get to get the next one. It seems the same with the cultural trends that, you know, just as soon as you've adopted the latest thing that's right, a month later you're told that is itself wrong and there's a new thing you've got to believe. And there's this extraordinary sort of planned obsolescence built into the moral yeah. culture. Yeah, but it's really the corporations that are pushing that. Um, and they're and they're pushing that because that's all they have to sell, yeah. um, and that's the only sign of that is the sign of their productive value, and it's how they defend their position. Um, you know, in America, we basically got rid of a lot of our factories and replaced them with computer firms, um, tech firms. You know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, Netflix, and Google. You know, those are those are the companies that we're known for, not for. Um, car manufacturing. We don't manufacture cars in America anymore. I mean, um, you know, even if even if you want to buy a car that's manufactured in America, the most you can get is that all the parts came from China and then they put it together in the United States. So, um, so our corporations aren't you know con contributing stuff to the real world. It's mostly in the virtual world. Um, and in that world, the, you know, the, the rate of, it's mostly superficial changes, but kind of the rate of trends can, can move very fast. It's part, of their mar it's part of their market position too. You can't criticize Google. You cannot criticize Amazon. Even if you're, even if you're on the left in the United States, you can't criticize these companies. Um, why? Because they're good you know, left-wing progressive companies. Um, you know, the, uh, Amazon uh, in the United States um, has really harsh labor practices. You know, every employee has is tracked in what they're doing constantly. You know, on on devices, and if you're delivering packages for Amazon, you know, Amazon tracks how many you're delivering, and it you know constantly raises its demanded rate of package delivery from you until you break and then I'll hire, just hire someone else, right? Um, and they treat their factory workers the same way. But, um, yeah, and there, sorry, there was a, uh, I'm remembering something else, there was a, a scandal a few years ago because um, Amazon was punishing its employees for taking too many bathroom breaks. Um, you know, they would track the number of, you know, if you had to walk off the factory floor over here, then, you know, you're, you lose points. But, um, there, Amazon had a commercial. Uh, I was watching a sports game a year or two ago. Amazon had a commercial, and it was of a um, man, I think, um, who had previously been another sex, I guess, um, saying tearfully into, into the camera, I love working for Amazon so much, it's such a good company. Like they were talking about their mother or something. You know, it's, Amazon is so good to me when I realized that I wanted to change my sex. Amazon paid $200,000 in medical expenses. <laughs> you know, it's like really tear, tear jerking like the advertisement was basically emotional abuse or blackmail of the audience. Like you can't criticize these companies because the one worker out of 10,000 that needs this kind of, chooses this kind of path will be supported by them. So they, they use this as a defensive mechanism too. Virtue signaling, I suppose. Um, so we've got some questions from the audience here. Um, the first one is a good question. Uh, so you mentioned that in the US there is a problem of misconceiving reality. The war in Ukraine can help, uh, can the war in Ukraine help the US to somehow get in touch with the more real questions and problems? 
And I suppose there's a question about all of us now that we've, we've, there have been a lot of issues in the world where we've been, uh, we've been preoccupied by uh, you know, COVID, climate, and so on. But I've certainly felt since the war kicked off, I've sort of sat up a bit straighter. I've thought, oh, there's something more urgent. Is that something you feel? Um, it certainly does provide the opportunity for that. Um, the thing that I'm worried about is that this um, media world that, our, that we've created in the West and that our tech companies have created um, has given us um, a poor, a bad set of habits for evaluating the conflict correctly. Um, most Americans have reacted to the conflict just as though they were reacting to a racist outrage or to you know, some uh, scandal that should result in canceling uh, a person online. You know, oh, well, it's been revealed that um, such and such a uh, you know, football player in, who was very famous engaged in sexual harassment. We're going to delete and erase this person from human memory um, and think that we've done something really good. Um, that's basically how, you know, the that's basically how the discussion has gone in the United States. It's like, oh, Russia did a bad thing. Simple. We'll just erase them from the internet. Um, you know, it's like, hey guys, this is uh, this is this is geopolitics and military conflict, not meme warfare. Um, so you know, you had all these. Um, you have, had, you have had all these stories in the U.S. Actually, if you just if, if you just go on 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 Google and search, um, Russia is losing the information war. You get like pages of results, and all the articles have the same title: Russia is losing the information war. Russia may be gaining ground in Ukraine, but they're losing the information war. And it's like I it actually makes me wonder. Um, I'm sure there are some like serious people in the room somewhere, but a lot of our politicians honestly have spent so much time online you know, that they're conditioned to react to major global conflicts, not in the form of you know, serious evaluation, you know, which is the best set of uh, options to lead to peace, you know, could this path potentially lead to nuclear war? No, it becomes this one-upmanship um, where you know, okay, well, this company tried to, this company, you know, canceled Russia, so we're gonna double cancel Russia, and it becomes like a, um, you know, a, a childish game in an extremely high stakes environment. So it should lead to, you know, waking up and really studying the, studying the issues, but a lot of the reflexes that are built in are now this like 24 hour um, reflex environment in American politics at least. It's interesting what you're describing there is like, uh, they don't have air superiority, but we have moral superiority. I suppose that's the, yeah. Um, so another question here is, um, uh, okay, so do you, you've talked about the influence of the US and how it's used to spread equality. Do you think that someday a powerful country like the US could do the opposite and promote inequality globally? And if so, why? Or how, I suppose? Um, <clears throat> I guess a lot depends on what we mean what we mean by, um, by inequality there. Um, so, I mean, I guess you could say that, um, I mean, arguably, arguably what the US has done is ultimately promote the, the wealth of its own tech companies. Um, and so that has created a kind of bad um, playing field as we were saying a minute ago, you don't know what they're gonna pull out of the hat next year. Um, so from a cultural standpoint, a lot of the rest of the world you know, has to wait and be subject to what um, magical concept is coming next. You know, what magical concept are we going to you know, measure countries by to see if they live up to this random new idea? In fact, that does, it, it, it is, I guess what I'm trying to say is this, because the concept of equality is so open-ended, it's created a situation in which 
Um, the people who get to decide what that concept means have extraordinary power and therefore have created a you know, situation of inequality. If the question meant, can the US one day restore sanity, um, it, it could if there are, um, I mean, the US is not going to cease to be an important player in um, you know, those parts of the world that are under, under its influence. Um, and I think that there are people who would realize hey, you know, if, um, if security in Europe is now one of the, the most important things, of course it always has been, but if it's really urgent right now, maybe we should stop like exporting destructive uh, cultural stuff to Europe. Um, you know, the, maybe we should stop exporting, you know, stuff which, you know, makes people degraded and not love their country. Maybe we should stop telling people not to be patriotic. Maybe we should encourage people to be patriotic. Um, it's possible to reach all of those conclusions. So uh, we've only got a, a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes. So I'm gonna try and get in as many as I can. Um, the, so, uh, but, so very quickly, uh, here's a challenging question for you. Uh, that the, the main idea is, is that the main idea of your speech or the framing of, of your speech was about democracy in America. But the questioner says, but in their understanding, the principle of democracy is about freedom of choice, but you instead focused on uh, the issue of equality a lot. And, and why, why did you make, why focus on equality rather than freedom of choice when we're talking about democracy? Um, equality always trumps freedom in the development of democracy. I mean, like the, the um, I think the story of democracy is that it's a kind of idea um, and it's an idea which becomes more and more substantive over time. Um, it no longer tolerates freedom of choice. It has become more intolerant. Why is that the case? Maybe, maybe it's more natural for people to want to live in a world that has, uh, in, in, a, in a political society that has a clear goal um, and just an open-ended goal of freedom is, is not enough. Um, but um, but an, an, an example, uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, in the United States, before uh, Trump came along, you know, it was, it was okay, if you were a conservative at, uh, at, a, at a university, um, it was okay to like be quiet and not go along with the sort of left wing trends. But once Trump came into power, it was no longer enough to be quiet. You didn't have like the freedom to choose. It was obligatory to denounce him. And if you did not denounce him, then you were guilty of supporting him. That was the new mindset. Um, a similar thing has happened around the rainbow flag, right? At first, the rainbow flag is just a, an emblem of freedom. If you're into that, fly the rainbow flag. Now it's obligatory. You have to wear it. You have to have it. You have to put it in your, you know, Twitter account or whatever. It has to be there or else you're not, um, not on board. So equality has become more and more substantive. It's less about elections like, um, you know, the European Union is totally democratic because it promotes democratic things, even if it's not, you know, even if it's kind of thrown out, it's thrown out every democratic form of resistance to it whenever it's encountered it. So democracy, in democracy, uh, people think of democracy as being about freedom and equality, but I, w I would really say that the equality, the concept of equality is more fundamental um, and, it and it drives further and it ends up squashing the idea of freedom. Can I just ask, how many questions are there gonna be, does anyone in the audience have a question to ask uh, in person? Okay, at least one. Okay, I'm gonna throw three questions at you here from here um, and, uh, and then we'll get to that question. That may be as much as we've got. Um, so the three questions are, first, um, uh, America is, talks about equality a lot, yet it also supports authoritarian regimes like Saudi or segregation of states like Israel and indeed formerly apartheid South Africa, that's what it, uh, the question is. Uh, how does it account for, uh, how do they account for this hypocrisy? First question. Second question is, um, in the last few decades, America has 
uh, obviously been very polarized, and the last two elections have been quite fiercely contested. Is there a possibility of an American civil war going forward? And finally, probably the most very relevant question to the audience here is, um, it says, uh, for how much longer do you think the European people can digest these alien ideas coming from the other side of the world? Is there a chance of a cultural counter-revolution? So hypocrisy yeah. and civil war, and what could Europeans do to avoid your cultural imperialism? Um, <clears throat> I mean, from my own, from my own standpoint, um, you know, geopolitical strategy should be separate from, um, you know, uh, sorry, geopolitical strategy can't just be driven by morality and moralism. Um, it is true that, you know, America uses this idea when it can see, when it thinks it's uh, u useful for it. During the Cold War, obviously, the United States allied with all sorts of unsavory, you know, openly dictatorial regimes. There was even a term for this strategy. It was called Kirkpatrickism, um, named after an essay by uh, Gene Kirkpatrick in the 1980s. Um, I forget what the essay was called, but the essay was just about this, that you know, America will choose uh, an ally of um, strategic importance over an ally of values when necessary. Um, but again, in the media-driven culture, that calculus is getting obscured. Um, in the media-driven culture, the, um, you know, we're very susceptible to you know, waves of trendy um, moral outrage, and they're not consistent. They don't, you know, they don't hit all of their targets. They're not used all the time. They're more like a, more like a fit, more like a, like a, you know, getting possessed by something. Um, so, um, at any rate, I think that's that one. What was the second question? Uh, so, uh, um, so that was the hypocrisy Civil question. War? Civil war, is it possible? And thirdly, can the, is there any way um, non-American societies, particularly European society, can push back against these, uh, uh, the spread of American cultural imperialism? I mean, there's always a lot of talk about civil war in America because we had one. Um, but I don't think it's very realistic. Um, you know, there has been, um, there has been a, a geographic rearrangement of America over the last couple of years, and that's actually one thing that um, helps to prevent civil war. When we had a civil war in the United States, there was a fundamental economic difference between the North and the South. The entire economy of the South was based on slavery and was based on um, slaves doing work on plantations, and the North was industrial. Um, right now, that the economy doesn't have a characteristic like that. Um, there are some, you know, some problems. You know, the cities are much more successful than the deep countryside. So there's like a brain drain toward the cities. There's tension between left-wing cities and the right-wing countryside. It's that way in a lot of parts of the, um, a lot of parts of the developed world. Um, but what happened during COVID-19 and the response to the COVID-19 pandemic is that people left left-wing cities. You know, people left New York and moved to Florida. People left Chicago. Uh, people left California and moved to Texas by, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and you can look at uh, population change charts um, since, uh, since, yeah, since 2020 um, on, a, on a US map and you know, the population of San Francisco is down like 10% and New York like 10% or something like that. Um, and you know, uh, the num or th you can look at the number of uh, new houses being built. Texas, you know, tons of new real estate is being built. Florida, tons of new apartments and houses are being built. So people are moving and that provides a kind of relief um, you know, we still have a more decentralized form of government than, um, than a lot of countries, and so, you know, there's more of a, uh, more of a coming apart. I mean, it's, so it's not a civil war, but there is a kind of interior separation, you know, within the United States. Conservatives want to live in red states. They're 
sick and tired of living in you know left-wing dominated cities they want nothing to do with them it's hard to figure out exactly how that would play forward obviously it leads to some greater tension but i don't think it leads to civil war um at least in the next 10 years or 20 years something like that um you know with regard to whether um uh you know europe can avoid toxic cultural trends from the other side of the world um, I think that the that the geopolitical changes that are going on now um, will increase the likelihood of that will in, you know will potentially lead to a better outcome um, for two reasons first of all um, if there are adults in the room in the West then they should realize that continually propagandizing um, you know, uh, countries with toxic cultural values does not actually help their own security situation, so they should stop doing that. Um, and second, that we're starting to see a splintering of the global internet. Um, you know, right now there's like the Great Wall, the Great Firewall of China. Um, you know, Russia has kind of disconnected from the rest of the global internet. So now we're all living in the American internet. Um, it's not just, it's not like the free and open internet. It's the American-run internet, um, and there's going to be tensions that arise within that. Maybe geopolitical tensions. Maybe, you know, does does France want its foreign policy dictated to it by like American meme accounts on Instagram? You know, probably not. So we'll probably start to see more, um, you know, uh, more pulling back culturally within different parts of the West. I suppose it depends how good the meme is, though. So we had a couple of questions around cancel culture, and they said, today's cancel culture is most likely a product of the, of the before-mentioned individual's fight for equality. What is your opinion of this cultural movement? Do you think it has a stay, or is it too much? Cancel culture, that is. So do you think cancel culture, saying cancel culture, the argument is cancel culture could be argued to have come from people's fight for equality, so s trying to silence voices that they see are opp oppressing them in some way, or limiting their life experience in some way. Um, and uh, do you think this is a valid argument, and uh, or do you think cancel culture has gone too far? And indeed, do you think cancel culture is of one side or the other? Is it a left thing? Is it a right thing? Is it just social ostracism in general? What, what's your view on cancel culture? I mean, I think my general view is that that societies want to have a value of some sort. Um, you know, society can't live on freedom alone. Um, you know, something will assert itself as a value. Um, you know, that's what the ancients said. That's what Aristotle said, Plato said. So they're probably right. Um, so I think it's kind of like um, liberalism. Liberalism said we didn't have to do that. You know, we could just have a society based on freedom alone, just on freedom of choice, with no content. Um, but um, again, in democracy, equality wins over time. So if you say that you're devoted to freedom, eventually equality is going to insert itself with a specific picture and it's gonna demand assent. Um, so I think it's a wake up call for conservatives. You know, most conservatives in Anglo-American countries were primarily devoted to freedom. Um, usually they meant by that not being dominated by the other guy, you know, or having reasonable you know, freedom of inquiry within some fundamental value commitments. Um, but there was a section of the right, you know, more libertarian, that made radical freedom its, its fundamental idea. And th that is, and that I think is actually a very weak idea. It can easily be overwhelmed um, by anything else. So, um, you know, cancel culture, the way, th the way that it, you know, uh, shows itself in America can certainly be perverse. Um, it can be very cruel um, and arbitrary, but again, it's just showing the, the, the need for society to have some, you know, some standard that it's following. Um, so fundamental values are not partisan, you know, they're not left or right, you know, nationality, identity, you know, tradition, family, um, culture, entrepreneurship, all those things are fundamental. Uh, values, you can have a left-wing or a right-wing perspective on them, for sure. Um, but, you know, we have to be about more than just um, throwing off the chains. We have to assert some fundamental values because 
If we don't, they'll just be replaced by other ones. Well, that about wraps it up, folks. So thank you very much to everyone for coming out today. And thank you, Gladden, for the interesting talk. Um, and uh, I think uh, there's no more questions, I take it. So great. Thank you so much. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed the second Transylvania lecture. When's the next one, Christina? End of April. End of April. OK, right. OK. Uh, no, so at some point in April, there will be another one. So thank you so much. And let's give a round of applause to Gladden. Thanks, Gladden. Thank